It's my immense honor to introduce Andrea Allen. I met Andrea Allen at Harvard when I was invited to give a lecture there. She uh, came up to me afterward and asked if we could talk about queer studies in Brazil. And then we met again in Brazil in Belo Horizonte at a conference and had a long conversation about her dissertation topic as she was developing it. Um, and then I was very, very honored to be asked to be on her doctoral committee at Harvard in the Department of Anthropology um, and, um, and work with her on her doctoral dissertation, which transformed itself into an amazingly important, incredibly important work. Uh, the title, uh, Violence and Desire in Brazilian Lesbian Relationships, is going to be published by Paul Grave. It was published by Paul Grave in 2015 and is an extremely important pioneering work on lesbian studies, same-sex studies in Brazil. There's very little literature there, very little good literature, and this, it, her work is just kind of an, a model for future scholars, both Brazilian and others, to do that. Um, Brown um, Brazil Initiative has been focusing this last two years on really uh, identifying and bringing to campus the top Afro-Brazilian and African-American scholars working on Brazil as a way of really uh, emphasizing the importance that they played in scholarship. And so uh, this is one of the many reasons why we wanted to have uh, Andrea among the people we've invited this semester. She, as I mentioned, had received her PhD in anthropology from Harvard and is a lecturer in the Department of Women's Studies and Feminist Research at the University of Western Ontario. And she is currently conducting an ethnographic research project about the experiences of LGBT uh, evangelicals in Brazil. Andrea. Uh, thank you, Jim, for those kind words, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming here and thank the Brazilian initiative, the Brazil Initiative, and the Watson Institute for the invitation to speak with the Brown community today. Uh, in this talk, I will discuss my book, Violence and Desire in Brazilian Lesbian Relationships, which focuses on the lives of women, primary, primarily Afro-Brazilian women, in same-sex relationships in Salvador. In the book, I argue that Brazilian lesbian women both reject and reinscribe Brazilian cultural mores surrounding sexuality, gender roles, and violence. Furthermore, I contend that even as Brazilian lesbian women are able to embody Brazilian ideals to a far greater degree than heterosexual women in the country, they experience social and political invisibility when they seek redress from the state as victims of intimate partner violence. Brazilian cultural norms that emphasize emotionality and what I call erotic embodiment or passionate physicality are fundamentally connected with Brazilian male authority, privilege, and even Brazilian identity as a whole. Within Brazilian culture, whiteness, maleness, and wealth characterize the ideal romantic and marital partner who is also the indisputable recipient of brown and black women's sensuality and sexuality. The intertwining relationship between emotionality, erotic embodiment, and white masculinity produce cultural norms that emphasize men's sexual dominance and freedom, which ultimately endorse or at least rationalize their extramarital or extra-relational sexual activities. Consequently, heterosexual women are limited by their cultural and social position as the passive submissive partner in a romantic relationship with men. Furthermore, because Brazilian women, especially black and brown-skinned women, must grapple with essentialist notions about their lascivious natures, their, sensuali their sexuality remains the purview of boyfriends, husbands, and even Brazilian society, which can be construed as the masculine partner writ large. In contrast, I argue that lesbian women are more able to occupy this masculinized space and indulge their emotive and bodily desires and pleasures. This social and romantic occupation of masculinity can be perceived as a rejection of heterosexual relationships and, by extension, Brazilian patriarchal power. Yet lesbian women's paradoxical rejection through appropriation of Brazilian cultural norms also influences the presence of intimate partner violence, IPV, in their relationships. Intimate partner violence, I contend, reflects in part Brazilian lesbian women's reproduction of Brazilian cultural ideals that associate emotionality and passionate physicality with power and physical violence. 
Before I discuss my ethnographic findings, I will briefly describe the phenomenon of intimate partner violence in Brazil and throughout the world for both heterosexual and same-sex relationships. Next, I will detail the development of racialized, gendered, and sexualized tropes in Brazilian history, which, I argue, have influenced the presence of IPV in Brazilian society. These national, global, and historic historical context will provide a framework for understanding lesbian women's experiences with infidelity and IPV in Salvador. I then will conclude by discussing women's police stations, gendered citizenship, and Brazilian lesbian women's status as invisible citizens. Brazil and Salvador in particular provide a unique setting for the study of female same-sex sexuality, IPV, and cultural and gender norms. Foremost, Brazilian culture is a society of contrast. For example, while, while there have been numerous legislative and legal advancements in the area of LGBT rights, many LGBT Brazilians experience familial ostracism, verbal harassment, workplace discrimination, and violence. For example, a recent survey by Grupo Guida Bahia found that one LGBT Brazilian is murdered every 25 hours in Brazil. Brazilian heterosexual women as well are vulnerable to experiencing violence. Until the early 1980s, men were granted virtual impunity for crimes against passion or for <coughs> defending their honor and murdering their girlfriend or wife because of their sexual betrayal. Only in 1991 did the Brazilian courts deem the defense of honor argument impermissible in court. Currently, murder and other extreme acts of violence are no longer tolerated in Brazilian society, and further reforms have been made, culminating in the implementation of the groundbreaking Maria da Pena law in 2006. This law was named after a woman who was victimized when her husband attempted to murder her twice, and she was then further victimized by the Brazilian state through its apathetic and pathetic actions with regards to prosecuting, convicting, and incarcerating her husband. The Maria da Pena law, as well as the creation and expansion of police stations that only serve women, demonstrate that significant life-saving reforms have occurred in Brazil. Despite these advancements, there continues to exist a cultural space in Brazil for perhaps what one could call mild forms of violence, such as pushes, shoves, and slaps in romantic relationships. This acceptance is, is exemplified in the common Brazilian phrase, entre tapas e beijos, between slaps and kisses. This saying, entre tapas e beijos, is an unofficial and informal acknowledgement that anger can be bodily expressed just as passion is bodily expressed. Based on the continued evolution of the government's response to IPV and cultural discourses about acceptable behavior or romantic relationships, there seems to be a limited acceptance of physical aggression between a Brazilian husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend. Even though allowances are made, this space is not gender neutral. Yes, incidents of Brazilian women slapping their men upon finding out about their husband's sexual betrayal is not uncommon or perceived as culturally out of the norm. However, the use of violence in Brazil, as in many parts of the world, is not associated with women, but with men who are considered the dominant partner in a heterosexual relationship. A man's use of violence culturally comes from a place of authority, while a woman's violent act is construed as a defensive action, her way of acting out. It is important to note that not all Brazilians have violent encounters with their lovers or consider violence as an acceptable form of communication in a romantic relationship. Furthermore, extreme and severe acts of violence and the infliction of bodily damage are condemned and no longer tolerated to a degree never before seen in Brazilian history. Yet the use of any form of violence has not been co completely erased or denounced within the Brazilian cultural framework. Typically, descriptions of intimate partner violence within Brazilian society and worldwide are heteronormative and androcentric in nature. Men perpetrate violence against their female romantic partners. Unfortunately, this form of intimate partner violence against women occurs throughout the world, though countries and regions have differing rates of prevalence, ranging from 10% to 70%. Findings about Brazilian women's experiences with IPV have concluded that roughly one-third have been physically assaulted at least once in their lifetimes. In comparison to the United States, a recent CDC study found that American women experience physical violence in their re romantic relationships with men at a rate of 30%. Despite the association and framing of IPV with, as a heterosexual problem, studies in North America on IPV and lesbian relationships have found that anywhere between 30 to 40% of the surveyed women have had at least one experience with physical assault in their same-sex relationships. Because many of these studies are quantitative, there's a level of complexity absent from the analysis that calls for the execution of ethnographic research on this subject matter. <laughs>
When I first began conducting field work in Salvador about lesbian women, I was interested in investigating the relationship between nationalist ideologies and discrimination against lesbian women in Brazil. But as so often happens in the field, the focus of my research evolved and transformed through my prolonged interactions with lesbian women in Salvador. Time and again, women told me stories, often nonchalantly, that involved physical altercations between them and their female lovers. Intimate partner violence between lesbian women was a phenomenon that I could not ignore. I conducted 15 months of ethnographic fieldwork in Brazil, and my ethnographic data primarily derived from my interactions with women from three social networks in Salvador. The first network consisted of Afro-Brazilian and black working class and poor lesbian women. The second, a group of middle and upper middle class white and non-black lesbian women. And the last network consisted of Afro-Brazilian and black women who were involved to varying degrees in black lesbian, black feminist, or black activist movements. Drawing from these three networks, as well as other interactions, I gathered ethnographic data that consisted of interviews and observations from personal interactions, informal interviews, and participation in LGBT activities. Formal interviews with lesbian women were particularly important to the execution of my fieldwork, which I conducted with 38 women of disparate socioeconomic, educational, religious, and racial backgrounds. Of the 38 women, roughly 60% or 23 had experienced at least one incident of physical aggression as the perpetrator and or victim in a romantic relationship with another woman. I specifically use the term physical aggression here to acknowledge that intimate partner violence is not always physical in nature as emotional, mental, psychological abuse, intimidation, and stalking are all forms of IPV as well. <clears throat> Another finding from my research connected physical aggression with the emotion of jealousy, desire for domination and power, and especially with the act of infidelity or traison, betrayal in English. Of the 38 women in the study, 22 self-reported engaging in traison. It is important to clarify that while there were often correlation between the two groups of women who had both engaged in traison and experienced IPV as a perpetrator and or victim, not all of the women identified a causative relationship between a specific act of traison and a specific act of physical aggression. Yet, traison and IPV were often connected in women's narratives, indicating that this connection warranted exploration. Integral to this exploration has been an analysis of the roles of Brazilian cultural narratives in shaping ideologies surrounding sexuality, gender roles, and emotionality in Brazilian culture. Of the nationalist ideologies or narratives that pervade Brazilian society, its imagination, and cultural psyche, Bra Brazilian emotionality is a concept that helps to illustrate the relationship between Brazilian practices of embodiment and the phenomenon of intimate partner violence in the country. Though I will not focus on nationalism, a discussion of the development of certain Brazilian nationalist ideologies will illuminate the relationship between Brazilian emotionality and Brazilian conceptions concerning sexuality, gender, race, and power. According to the rhetoric at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, the mixing of the Portuguese, African, and indigenous peoples produced three sad races. As a result, public intellectuals of the day characterized the Brazilian people as weak, feeble, and vulnerable. Yet this same feeble Brazilian populace was also described as lascivious and sensual, thus presenting a rather unique portrait of Brazilian society. Until the publication of Gilberto Freire's seminal work, Casa Grande Senzalas, in 1933, Brazilian miscegenation practices were largely associated with embarrassment and shame because of the aforementioned characteriz characterizations of the Brazilian people. In defense of the Brazilian populace, Freire concluded that the effects of slavery and the environment on the Brazilian body, and not heredity, were the roots of Brazilian inferiority. Freire also argued that an important byproduct of miscegenation practices was the formation of a racial as well as a sexual paradise in Brazil. In order to make this argument, Freire openly employed the language of sadomasochism, racial eroticization, sexual exploitation, and patriarchal privilege as evidence for his assertions. Freire's apologetic work was highly influential in the transformation of national and international notions about the Brazilian people. Thus, the Brazilian people were not weak and feeble, but a wondrous melange of virility and sensuality. For Freire, Brazil's racial democracy was intrinsically connected with, the Brazilian, with Brazilian sexuality and emotionality. Alone, Gilberto Freire could not have transformed the Brazilian cultural psyche or raised the country's self-esteem. He was on the precipice of a larger nationalist movement burgeoning in Brazilian intellectual and governmental circles, culminating in the election of Getulio Vargas under Brazil's new constitution in 1934. 
Vargas and his administration employed ideologies sim similar to Freire's as effective tools in a strategy of offensive nationalism. Vargas himself was posited as a father figure akin to a Mediterranean <coughs> pater familias. Vargas was the father and man who was honorable, virile, gregarious, affectionate, and most importantly, fully in charge of his family, the Brazilian nation. Although Vargas's father figure did not share all the attributes of Freire's patriarchal arch archetype, both representations do share aristocratic mentality. The centrality of the patriarchal figure to Brazilian nationalist discourses underscores the similarity between Vargas's father figure and Freire's Port Portuguese colonizer and Brazilian master. Both were in the position to control and dominate those who were considered inferior to them. The intertwining of Vargas's and Freire's patriarchal, patriarchal tropes enabled the pr production and promulgation of the image of a complex male leader as a figurehead of Brazilian society who could subjugate and woo the Brazilian populace at the same time. While other nationalist ideologies and movements have developed and influenced Brazilian society over the years, scholars and I have argued that the nationalist foundations laid during the Vargas administration continue to influence Brazilian culture in the present day. The influences of these ideologies can be seen in the continued elevation of whiteness and masculinity and the pervasive eroticization of brownness, but not blackness and femininity in Brazilian society. While the ideology of Brazilian emotionality is pervasive in Brazilian society, equally pervasive ideologies encompass gender and sexual expectations. Central to discussions about eroticism and sexual pleasure in Brazil are dominant and mainstream constructions of sexual roles that focus on men's bodies and sexual masculinity. Within Brazil's sexual universe, the active-passive sexual framework prevails as the guiding principle that governs sexual activities, activities, activities and practices because real men are esteemed as the active partner in a sexual encounter with a woman or another man. The masculine partner is the penetrator or the eater of his feminine partner who's the penetrated or the receiver. Having anal sex with another man, therefore, does not detract from one's manhood as long as one is in the active dominant sexual position. On the other hand, men are positioned or considered emasculated if they occupy the feminine passive position, thereby making them weak and vulnerable like women. It is important to note, however, that beginning in the mid-20th century, Brazilian sexual categories began to emerge that were not built upon an active passive sexual paradigm. Instead, a focus on sexual exchange emerged where both partners were neither active nor passive. While the emergence of these sexual categories signaled a transformation of Brazil's sexual universe, it continues to be clear that the active passive sexual paradigm prevails in the 21st century. A perusal of Brazilian television, popular music, Brazilian culture as a whole events this reality. The dominance of this sexual framework is significant because it points to a directionality in the flow of pleasure during a sexual encounter. And this sexual directionality represents the flow of power as well. For example, while in recent years there, have been more, there has been more discussion about women's orgasms in Brazilian society, it is generally the male active part participant's orgasm that is the focal point in the sexual encounter. This sexual and gender hierarchy is also reflected in cultural ideologies about infidelity, or traição. Despite notions of Brazilian emotionality, sexual betrayal cannot be equally employed by Brazilian women and men. One recent study of adults between 20 and 50 had the rate of infidelity for men at 67% and for women at 23%. Thus, women can be full of emotion, but not full of sex, because their bodily desires should be restrained. Yet Brazilian women are, women are also expected to be passionate and intense human beings who, as women, are innately sensual and seductive temptresses. In contrast, Brazilian men can indulge th their sexual whims at will, demonstrating their prowess, virility, and dominance. On the other hand, a woman's philandering behavior is still considered a taboo in Brazilian society because a man's lack of control of his wife's sexual behavior demonstrates that he is passive, feminine, and submissive in the relationship with his female partner. Clearly, infidelity in heterosexual relationships has gendered implications. Despite the fact that lesbian women in Brazil are influenced and shaped by the same gendered and sexual paradigms that govern heterosexual women's sexual behavior and responses to infidelity, the experience of lesbian women with traição resemble the behavior and attitudes of some Brazilian heterosexual women, men. Of the 38 women I formally interviewed, the fidelity statuses were discussed with 31 of these women, 
and of the 31, only nine self-reported a continual status of sexual faithfulness to present and past lovers. In addition, there seemed to be no relationship between sexual fidelity in a woman's race, age, marital status, socioeconomic status, religion, or level of educational attainment. Lesbian women of all kinds, like heterosexual men, sexually betrayed their wives and girlfriends in Salvador. How can these rates of lesbian infidelity be explained? First, the premium given to passion, emotionality, intensity, as well as domination in Brazilian society cannot be forgotten. Second, the belief in a restrained and submissive female sexual sexuality cannot be overlooked as well. Thus, within a lesbian context, an emotive Brazilian lesbian is not constrained to a large degree by the cultural and sexual ideologies placed on women in heterosexual relationships. Therefore, women in same-sex relationships have more freedom to disregard heterosexual and heteronormative constructions of women's sexuality, and this freedom even transcends gender roles. There appeared to be no substantial correlation between gender identity in and outside the bedroom and infidelity. Both masculine and feminine identified lesbian women were perpetrators. I did observe, however, that for some women who identified as the active sexual partner, they expected sexual fidelity from their sexual partners, but not from themselves, mirroring some heterosexual men's attitudes about their women's sexual fidelity. Although sexual fidelity was still considered a treasured ideal for many of the women in the study, overall women were keenly aware that their expectations often did not coincide with reality. In fact, some women blatantly acknowledged that their sexual desires overwhelmed their belief in sexual fidelity. Alas, a conundrum unfolds for a certain type of Brazilian lesbian woman. Even as she acts like a Brazilian man in sexual affairs, she expects her female lover to be sexually faithful like a heterosexual woman. Overall, Brazilian lesbian women have more freedom than heterosexual women in their sexual decision making because they can experience Brazilian erotic embodiment from a standpoint that acknowledges the uncontrollable carnality of desire as a superior ideal in relation to sexual fidelity. The seeming liberation of lesbian women does not negate the reality that there can be negative consequences for all parties because of a belief in unrestrained emotionality and erotic embodiment. The most pronounced of these was surely intimate partner violence. This interstitial space that lesbian women inhabit in Brazilian society is illustrated through analysis of their experiences with infidelity and IPV. On one hand, their acts of infidelity demonstrate that lesbian women are not completely beholden to heteronormative power structures. However, their violent behavior towards each other directly relates, I contend, with these very same systems of domination. The manifestation of intimate partner violence in lesbian relationships occurs in part because the elevation of passion and bodily pleasures as almost sacrosanct creates a space for the emergence of both physical aggression and the acceptance of this sanctioned bodily response. It is important to be clear that I am not arguing that the, Brazilian that the idea of Brazilian emotionality, the belief that Brazilians are a passionate, intense, and emotive people, and infidelity and jealousy are the only reasons or factors that influence the presence of IPV and romantic relationships in Brazil. There are myriad factors that are involved, some of which I will soon discuss. However, for the lesbian women I encountered in Salvador, these topics were often mentioned and connected with violence in their relationships. As I previously mentioned, roughly 60% of the women in my study experienced IPV in the form of physical violence as the perpetrator and or victim. Their experiences of perpetrating physical violence or being physically assaulted spanned a wide spectrum, a single incident of a slap on the face, a push or shove on the shoulders, burns by a cigarette, or repeated incidents that involve punch, punches and kicks to the body. In addition, the ways in which women discuss these experiences conveyed the complexity and at times the amb ambiguity of their feelings about them. For example, some women did not consider certain physical acts as forms of violence. During formal interviews, when I would ask if they ever had a physical fight with their girlfriend, some women would answer in the negative. However, later in the interview, in response to another question, the same women would mention acts of physical aggression. Two women, for example, were slapped in or pushed by their respective female partners because of sexual betrayal. Yet they considered these incidents so minor and insignificant in comparison with more extreme forms of physical violence. Even though there was disagreement about what constituted a violent act among the women in the study, there was widespread agreement that sexual betrayal and jealousy were the primary reasons for the occurrence of violence in their relationships. 
In addition to these factors, a, minu a minority of women also indicated that power struggles were influential, resembling heteronormative power dynamics that connected male anger about a female lover's infidelity with the fear of a loss of power or a challenge to a man's authority as the dominant partner. Since a heterosexual woman's sexual betrayal is an important indicator of a man's lack of control, it is understandable that a lesbian woman who considered herself the dominant partner in her same-sex relationship would also perceive her female lover's sexual betrayal as an outright <coughs> challenge to her authority. Because gender dynamics not only influence heterosexual relationships, but same-sex relationships as well, an association of IPV with masculine and lesbian women was not atypical. In fact, many lesbian women I encountered considered women who identified with a masculine gender identity, Buffy and Portuguese, as the primary perpetrators of IPV. Three women in my study who specifically identified with a masculine gender identity had perpetrated intimate partner violence in their relationships with Leji, femme, women. Yet all had also experienced some form of physical aggression by their Leji partners as well. Overall, many women in the study who perpetrated physical violence did not identify with a masculine gender identity or have a masculine appearance. The, their experiences indicate that to associate masculinity with violence in lesbian relationships elides the complicated and frankly muddy, muddied, muddled reality of lesbian women's use of physical force. Another consequence of the association of IPV with gender identity was the fact that many, regardless of a woman's socioeconomic status, associated physical violence with working class and poor lesbian women. Considering the vast majority of masculine identified lesbian women in Salvador are working class and poor, this association was understandable from their standpoint. Even more so for the upper middle class non-black lesbian women in the study, IPV was innately tied to gender and class. Some were incredulous that women in their social circles would and could engage in such behavior. Well, I too observed within my study a higher prevalence of IPV in lower class lesbian relationships. Of the nine upper middle class educated non-black women in the study, three had been involved repeatedly in mild forms of physical aggression, and another woman had mentioned that she was slapped by her girlfriend on one occasion. The fact that four out of nine experiences with IPV indicates that this violence can transcend gender identity as well as class lines. Despite the fact that lesbian women of various backgrounds experience um, intimate partner violence, one commonality among them was that they were those who were victims of intimate partner violence did not seek assistance from the two women's police stations in Salvador or from any other governmental entity. Even if they had sought support, based on my research, I would argue that the women's police stations were ill-equipped to handle cases involving IPV and women's same-sex relationships for a variety of reasons. First, the lack of consistency in regards to who could actually file a complaint was an indication of how lesbian women were considered, or rather not considered, as valid complainants. In 2008, I had the opportunity to interview one of the delegadas, or female police officials, at the women's police station in Brota, Salvador. When I asked her if, if a woman could file a complaint against her female lover, accusing her of intimate partner violence, she stated, quote, here in the delegacia, no, 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 we do not file complaints involving homoaffective relationships. It was revealing that the delegata specifically used the phrase "halasoins homoaffectivas, homoaffective relationships, because it is a phrase that has only recently be become part of the jargon of scholars, activists, and now government officials about same-sex sexuality in Brazil. In this instance, her invocation of the phrase appeared, in my estimation, to emphasize the sexual identity of lesbian women over their gender, thereby nullifying their femininity. Instead, she argued that like men who would want to file a charge against their female lovers, lesbian women too would have to go to a neighborhood police station. Five years later, when I returned to the women's police station in Brotas, and I also went to the one in Perepari, everyone I interviewed contradicted the delegado who spoke with me in 2008. They all stated that lesbian women could file a complaint against their female lover at a women's police station, which according to them was always the policy. Their statements appear to demonstrate that lesbian women do have equal access to all the services provided to heterosexual women, thereby refuting any allegation that they are unequal or second-class citizens in Brazil. On the other hand, I had heard of a inc one incident in which a lesbian woman was rebuffed when she attempted to file a complaint at the women's police station in Brotas. While anecdotal, this occurrence demands attentiveness to the possibility that lesbian women could experience obstacles. Furthermore, once I was told that lesbian women could be complainants, I inquired about the number of lesbian women 
who had actually registered a complaint or who had just visited the women's police station to discuss their victimization. Collectively, the six WPS personnel I interviewed at the both the Brotas and Periberi women's police station had dealt with no more than 10 cases, among them which involved a lesbian couple in a five-year span. To provide a context to understand the insignificance of this number, 11,036 complaints were filed by women in 2013 at the women's police stations in Protas and Pereperi, the year that I visited both of them. Thus, I would argue that based on these interviews and the experiences of lesbian women in Salvador, that while Brazilian lesbian women may have the legal right to file a complaint against their female lover, this does not mean that they have the cultural right to do so. One could argue that the lack of lesbian complainants can merely be an indication that women do not desire to file complaints against their female lovers because they would want to be discreet about their relationship problems or are ashamed. As I've argued elsewhere and can discuss further during the Q&A, a focus on lesbian discretion is less an example of the naturally discreet nature of lesbian women and more the consequence of the demand for them to be silent and invisible. If women are reluctant to go to their neighborhood police station to file a complaint against a male abuser because they fear the machista culture of the police, it is improbable that a lesbian woman would not seek the service. Is it improbable that a lesbian woman would not seek the service of a woman's police station because of homophobia that pervades Brazilian society? Even if a lesbian woman decides to visit the WPS in Salvador, she will not be attended by personnel who are trained in relationship to intimate partner violence in same-sex relationships. I was told as much by the psychologists and social worker who were employed at the WPS in Protas. While the personnel there and at the Periperi station appeared to be sincere and committed to their work as advocates for women, their lack of awareness of the issues that lesbian women face was a form of erasure that had implications for the treatment of lesbian victims and perpetrators of intimate partner violence. Lesbian women's perpetration of intimate partner violence does not occur in a vacuum. Fundamentally, IPV is a very personal experience, but is an intersubjective experience as well. In Brazil, cultural ideologies endorse images of Brazilians as of emotional, passionate, and intense people whose sexuality oozes from their pores. One of the consequences of this oozing is the perception that Brazilians' intense passion can lead to bodily expressions of anger and pain through IPV. In particular, incidents of jealousy and sexual betrayal contribute to the manifestation of these bodily expressions, especially for Brazilian men, whose authority and dominance can be threatened by even the implication that they are not in control of their heterosexual relationships. Control and dominance are constant themes throughout Brazilian history, and these themes are strongly associated with masculinity and power. In Gilberto Freire's description of Brazil's racial democracy, men, in particular wealthy white men, were in charge, not women, and certainly not their mulata lovers. Getulio Vargas was a strong and domineering father figure for Brazilian citizens who represented his submissive and loyal family. One of the legacies of these patriarchal narratives and assertions of Brazilian emotionality, as well as the manifestation of what I call erotic embodiment, is a Brazilian cultural landscape that hyper esteems the performance of all sentiments, whether they be creative or destructive through bodily expression. Yet this legacy does not affect Brazilian women and men equally, because men's extra relational sexual activities, as well as their expressions of dominance through physical aggression, are situated within a particular context. Unlike Brazilian women, their innate sexuality and sensuality does not have to be constrained because their actions only reinforce the cultural and social status quo. In contrast, Brazilian women who cuckold their men violate the sanctity of their intimate relationships and communal and social mora mores about how women are supposed to behave. In a sense, she's cuckolding Brazilian society as well. While a heterosexual woman's ability to betray her, woman, her male lover is restricted, lesbian women have more opportunities because they seemingly reject the cultural script of who is supposed to be the object of their desire and the recipient of their full fire. Ironically, their rejection and potential participation in bodily expressions of unrestricted sexual pleasure and romantic pain, like Brazilian men, is the ultimate expression of Brazilian identity their Brazilian birthright to be passionate, emotive, and authentic. However, despite lesbian women's potential to embody fully Brazilian identity and all its possibilities, this embodiment of Brazilianness does not afford them practically and culturally the services and by extension the rights afforded to heterosexual men in Brazil. Moreover, while the creation of women's police stations and the Maria da Pena law are clear signs that Brazilian society is grappling with the problem of intimate partner violence against women, 
These reforms are based on a gendered understanding of citizenship. Similar to Cecilia McDowell Santos, I am also troubled by the implications of this gendered citizenship because even though Brazilian women, lesbian women are ostensibly included, it is ultimately heteronormative in nature because, as she states, these gender police stations contribute to the formation of a gendered citizenship that benefits married women or women in heterosexual love relationships. Consequently, Brazilian women must become subjects and act within a heteronormative framework that is built upon dominant, submissive, active, passive, and masculine feminine paradigms. The combination of a masculinist police culture, conceptions about the role of women's police stations, and the heteronormative mission of these stations effectively disenfranchise lesbian women. Ultimately, this heterosexualization of citizenship ensures the continuation of a heteropatriarchal nation state because women's membership in the body politic is predicated on their relationship with domination, which is always already masculinized within the Brazilian context. As such, even if Brazilian lesbian women are perceived as victims of intimate partner violence, their victimization is il illustrative of their femininity and not their humanity. The treatment of lesbian women is indicative of specific ideological forces that work in Brazilian society as a whole, forces that are gendered, sexualized, and racialized. The marginalization of their experiences is in relation to intimate partner violence, for example, represents a structural and systematic erasure of women in same-sex relationships from the Brazilian citizenry. It must be noted, however, that in recent years, Brazilian lesbian women have become increasingly visible as members of Brazilian society. No greater example than Daniela Mercury assuming not just a lesbian identity, but an activist lesbian identity as well. The theme of her 2017 bloco in Salvador's Carnival is Empoderamento Feminino Negro and Gay, Female Black and Gay Empowerment. Yet despite her visibility and even the celebration of August as the month of lesbian visibility, lesbo lesbobophia in the forms of societal pressure for lesbian discretion, discrimination and violence against lesbian women, such as the phenomenon of corrective rapes, are rampant in Brazilian society. In the midst of these realities, Brazilian lesbian women have created a Brazilian identity of their own that upends and perturbs androcentric and nationalist constructions of sexual power and desirability. Similar to other marginalized populations, Brazilian lesbian women are not merely passive victims of unequal power relations and stigmatizing discourses. Rather, they protest against and resist the inequities that limit their social cho choices, while also playing an active role in the replication of the very cultural mo models that stigmatize them. Thank you. Before we open to questions, we have lots of time for mm -hmm. questions. Say here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to uh, amplify something I said in the mm -hmm. beginning the introduction, which is that um, I was one of the first people to work on um, male homosexuality in 20th century Brazil, my book, Beyond Carnival, and have really looked over the field over the last 20 years. And there is no one, no one in Brazil or anywhere else that's doing the kind of pioneering work you're doing. And it's to be applauded. It's hard. It's against the current, but it is wonderful. And I want to thank you for coming and being here. And so she thank deserves you. it. It's really important, her work. Um, and so you can field questions and yeah. uh, feel free to call one at a time or several and answer mm -hmm. as you will. Right. Uh, yes, Jake. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, maybe even the, just the geography of the police, women's, uh, the mm -hmm. women's police stations within the city of Salvador and mm -hmm. if you see any um, um, other kind of structural and infrastructural um, kind of limitations on um, complaint filing in terms mm -hmm. of um, hours that they're open. Um, um, I, so you have, you said that there was a psychologist and a social worker um, um, on staff. Um, notice that on a lot of like, Brazilian social service administration, there's always a lawyer, a psychologist, and kind of a social worker, kind of trio, like if there's, if, if kind of case management is, mm -hmm is kind of geared towards any type of ideal family or, um, or other kind of, I don't know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm just kind of fishing mm -hmm. for kind of. Well, uh, I would say overall, I mean, one of, I mean, not just in terms of their treatment of lesbian women who are complainants or who could potentially could be complainants, that a lack of resources is perpetually a problem for, 
I think for all women's police stations in, in Brazil, and I know specifically in, uh, for the ones in Salvador. So the one in Brotas is basically a, in downtown, well, sort of downtown in the center of the city, and then Pereperi is in the periphery of the city. And so Pereperi, the one there, was smaller, and they had le less personnel there. So the one at Brotas, they had, I mean, they, for, you know, Salvador has three million residents, and they basically had, I believe, two psychologists and one social worker on, on staff. So, I mean, that just sort of gives an indication of, of, you know, part of the reason that they have such few personnel there is because they don't have the resources, I think, to, um, to fund more personnel there. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing, too. Another factor is, and this is talked about by uh, Sarah Hutzinger, that oftentimes at, at least in her ethnography and her experience at the police station in Salvador, that some police officials would discourage women from filing complaints against their for lovers for different their male lovers for different reasons. So I think these factors involve in terms of infrastructure, the lack of funds, and also I think the police culture in terms of that even though there are female police officials, they still are indoctrinated and socialized within a masculinist and a machista culture that all of these affect the resources that are available for women and then how, you know, once those resources are available, you know, how effective they can be for women. Oh, yes? I'd like if you could, first of all, congratulations, that an excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. If you could <coughs> share a little bit more what you said about the third group that you would uh, black activists. Mm -hmm. So if you found any kind of difference in this group and what kind of struggles they're doing in Salvador and Brazil that you had found in um, so, I mean, what, I mean, and this is something I've, I talk about more extensively in my book, what I thought was interesting is that even among the women who were black activists and sort of activists, and this is to varying degrees, so there were women who maybe would go to one, one or two meetings, like maybe a year, to women who were sort of leaders and the different movements, that they too had experiences with intimate partner violence. Um, so that it was not just in terms of, of sort of cross-culturally, sort of cross-racial or socioeconomic lines, but also in terms of women who presumably were um, awakened or woke, how people say that, you know, <laughs> you know, that sort of that idea that even among them that they still had experiences with it. And another, I think, factor in terms of looking at activism and specifically in Salvador is that in comparison to gay activism in Salvador, that lesbian activism in Salvador, which mainly in terms of the, the activist movements outside of the academic circles were black lesbian activists, that they, you know, when I was there at least, they, you know, and I was there, you know, I started, you know, visiting Brazil in 2001, and last time I was there in 2013, that they went through, the different groups went through various permutations. They're, the groups were all, you know, different groups were organizing and then disbanding. And so in comparison to Grupo Gay de Bahia, for example, which has been continuously, you know, uh, you know, involved working since the early 1980s, that lesbian activism in Salvador seems to not be as well organized. And I think that can be for, for different reasons. And I think, you know, because of that, you know, looking at intimate partner violence is, while some people have looked at it in terms of there have been, you know, short pamphlets that have focused on intimate partner violence, uh, sort of a sustained look at it, I think, has not been a part of, of their agenda. And I think one of the reasons is because you have such upheaval, or there had been such upheaval. Yes, Jeff? Could you, um, I know your, your, your new work is, is in process, mm -hmm. and so I know you probably haven't come up with all the conclusions, but could you share just a little bit about your new work on LGBTQ? LGBT evangelicals in mm -hmm. Sao Paulo, which is a fascinating topic uh, since they're now 24% of the population yeah. and uh, and very seemingly homophobic. So I'm very curious to hear if you could tell us a little bit more about that, that yeah. research. So yes, yeah, so this is a new um, project that I've started. I was in uh, Sao Paulo this summer, um, and so I went to several um, evangel gay and evangelical identified churches. And so I say that because not only were these churches sort of self-identified as evangelical uh, or self-identified with Protestant, not just Protestantism, but with sort of evangelicalism, they also were self-identified as LGBT accepting. So one large church that I went to that is in uh, the neighborhood of Santa Cecilia is led by this lesbian couple. 
Um, Lana Holder is, is, uh, is sort of the main pastor, and she has been interviewed a lot on in sort of Brazilian media. And the congregation there, I would say, is at least a thousand uh, members to the church. The sanctuary holds at least probably a thousand people. They have um, online media, they have online presence, they live stream the services. And what was interesting is that when I was there, and I you know, went to you know, services several times a week, a lot of church going for me. Um, that, you know, I, I noticed at least in the majority of the members there were, were men in their 20s. So I would say almost like 60% of the members of this particular church were men in their 20s, while the whole, like, pastoral staff was, was female, which I thought was interesting. And then I went to another church there that was smaller, and it was led by uh, a gay man, and his, it was a, he has, you know, different satellites, and so I think in total he has maybe five to 6,000 members around Brazil, and that was a smaller church, and that, you know, the, the demographic profile there was, was different. It was slightly, it was older, maybe um, slightly darker in terms of, you know, more black and brown Brazilians, and um, they, it was also very mixed as a, in contrast to this other church, which was more like hip and cool and sort of the church that the 20-somethings would go to. And so what I thought was interesting is one of the things I found was interesting is how, you know, even though they are very, you know, in their sort of understanding of the Bible, open to LGBT people and believe that the Bible is open to LGBT people, they still are very rooted in evangelicalism in terms of how they hold the Bible, certain social conservative views they have, even in terms of evangelizing. One, one night I went out with them to uh, Largo da Arrocha, yeah. And they, you know, it was basically young, like, LGBT people, and they evan they gave out pamphlets, they sang, they, you know, it was, and it was funny because one, yeah, one girl said, like, does the, you know, she's basically said, like, does the church, you know, accept sapatonas? She, like, said that, and it was sort of interesting that she asked them that, and, you know, they did, and so people were praying with them who just were hanging out at the park. So, I mean, I think, you know, that these churches occupy, a, you know, particularly interesting space because they don't fit into the LGBT community in their estimation because they see that community as, I think, decadent and like full of debauchery. But they don't fit in the evangelical community, not because they don't want to fit in, but because they are not accepted in that community. So they are sort of in this in-between space. And another thing that I sort of found thought was interesting that many of the people that I talked to did not seem very political in the sense that um, while they were, you know, in terms of personally, you know, open and, you know, maybe to varying degrees to their family and, like, accepted themselves and being a part of the, of sort of coming into their own sexually and being a part of the church helped them to do that, this, you know, these evangelical gay churches, they also did seem to set themselves apart from LGBT activism because of certain ideas that they had, they had about it. And so for them, similar to other evangelical movements, the emphasis was on personal sort of transformation and their personal sort of relationship with, with Jesus, Jesus Christ. So again, they were very within sort of an evangelical mode, even though they were, they were gay. Can I ask a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. um, and most of the people that you interviewed who were LGBT mm -hmm. identified, were they people who were born into the Many of them, churches? yes. Many of them were born into the church. And so this was a way of their feeling they could continue to live their, yeah. their background. Yeah. Were there other converts into people? There were some, there are a few people who um, converted. There was, I mean, one in particular, a man I found was interested in some Paul and the large church that he was in seminary to be a priest and went, and he, you know, sort of knew he was gay and once he decided to, to come out or assume a gay identity, he, you know, was basically kicked out of a seminary and then he started going to this this evangelical church but most of the people that I met there and I'm this is I, I'm still you know this is the beginning of my research project it seemed that they were a part of the church and then they left the church once they uh, either they left on their own accord or they were kicked out for various reasons and then they came back to sort of Christianity and their faith through attending the, the, these evangelical churches Thank you again for having me.